Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the National Archives webinar. Today we're joined by Emily, um, who's going to talk about women during the First World War. Um, just a few starters about the layout before we start. Um, if you're using a computer or laptop, you will see that the chat dialog box and a series of buttons are on the right hand side. If you're using a mobile device, this will be on the left hand side. And you should be able to see a video of the presenter once I pass over to Emily and the presentation should be in the middle of the screen. And you can change the size of any of these features by clicking the arrow button, which is next to or underneath these features. So before we start, can I just confirm that you can see and hear me? And um, if you just type in yes or no into the chat box and we'll try and resolve any issues before we start. So if you can see, um, if you can hear me even, not see me yet, um, can you just type in yes or no into the chat box? Okay, good stuff. And is the audio okay for everybody? So please bear with us. This is a new venture for us. We do want to make sure it's working for everyone. Okay, um, if you do have any questions or comments throughout, um, if you can, you can interact via the chat box with me and other participants. Um, so if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, um, type them in the chat box and I will post them to Emily at the end. Um, the talk will last about 30 to 35 minutes and when I hand over you should be able to see Emily on the screen. So without further ado I'll pass you over. So enjoy the event everyone and if you are having any problems do let me know through chat. Afternoon everyone. My name is Emily and I will be presenting today's webinar. Uh, before we begin, I'll be referring to a few ways in which we search our online catalogue throughout this presentation. Um, we're going to provide you with um, a downloadable document that shows you how to perform these searches. If you look in the bottom right hand corner of your screen where it says documents, this is where you'll find the instructions. I'm going to highlight it for you all now. So there's an orange arrow flashing at it at the moment. The document in you need is in there. You can download this at any point during the webinar. And if you have any questions regarding it or any of the searches I refer to in this presentation, then please post your queries in the chat box and Lauren will be able to answer them for you. So tracing our ancestors, women in the military services during the First World War. So between 1914 and 1918, almost 9 million people across the empire signed up to serve Great Britain in some capacity. Roughly 80,000 of these people were women. Now, due to the all-encompassing nature of this modern conflict, it was the first time that such numbers of women were able to contribute in an official capacity. This is both at home and in theatres of war. To give you some kind of context, at this time, women's suffrage was still a massively contested issue, and women had to fight incredibly hard for the opportunity to contribute to the war effort. But gradually, over this period, the roles women could serve in spread across the military services and the home front. So there are four key areas in which women served during the First World War. We have military nursing services, Army, Royal Navy and Royal Air Force services, so auxiliary, auxiliary military services, we have the Merchant Navy and Home Services. And we have voluntary organisations. This webinar will cover those four key areas and will give you a brief overview of those services during the First World War and the records that the National Archives holds in relation to them. This will give you a good starting point when you begin your research. To begin with, we're going to look at military nursing. Nursing was one of the largest services undertaken by women during the, first, during the First World War. The two key military nursing services were the Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service. This included Territorial Force Nursing Services and they served the Army and included a Reserve Corps. So it's worth mentioning that they went under the ac acronym, acronym you can see highlighted on screen in bold. So that's Q-A-I-M-N-S and that's pronounced Quains. We also have Queen Alexandra's Royal Naval Nursing Service. They served with the Royal Navy and their commonly used acronym is Q-A-R-N-N-S and this is pronounced Quans. 
Both Queen Alexandra services predate the First World War, and they didn't have a large contingent, contingent of regular members. The Queens in particular had strict appointment regulations. Women had to be over 25, they had to be single, and they had to have independent means. This is particularly significant as most women were married by the age of 25. However, these rules were relaxed during the war due to the need for nurses. There were over 10,000 women nursing in the British military by the end of 1918. The service records can be found in the record series WO399. You can see an example on screen now. These are name searchable in discovery and can be viewed online for a small fee. Remember, if you need help doing any of these searches, please refer to the document we provided for you or ask Lauren any questions. So we have auxiliary military services. The First World War saw the creation of women's auxiliary military service in the Army, Navy and the RAF. We've got the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps, which are known as the WAX or the QMAX. We have Women's Royal Naval Service, who are known as the RENs. We have Women's Royal Air Force, and they're known as the WAFs. The R is silent there when you pronounce the acronym. Tellingly, women were enrolled and not enlisted in the military services. This highlights the fact that women were perceived to hold supporting roles only and were just there in order to free up men to fight at the front. First, we're going to look at the WAX and the QMAX. The Women's Auxiliary Army Corps was established in 1917 by the War Office. The WAX were re related, later renamed sorry, the Queen Mary's Army Auxiliary Corps in April of 1918 and as I said, um, they're commonly then referred to as the QMAX. Approximately 57,000 women served in the WAX and the QMAX during the war, and the service ran until 1921. WAX and QMAX were never entirely integrated into the British Army, nor were they ever given full military status. Their structure did not resemble the male army at all. Instead, officers were officials, non-commissioned officers were known as forewomen, and other ranks were known as workers. There were, however, a whole range of jobs that women held, including cooks, storekeepers, clerical workers, telephonists and drivers. The first space to look for records of a WAC or a QMAC are in their personnel or service records. These are held in the series WO398. There are approximately 7,000 of these records. And this only represents a 10% sample, which means there's a roughly one in 10 chance of you finding the women you're looking for. This is because most of the records were destroyed during the Blitz in the Second World War. In fact, if you look at the image on the right hand side of the screen, there should be a red dot highlighted over it at the moment. You can see the damaged edges where it came into contact with fire. These documents are sometimes called the burnt records. If it survives, though, there's a huge range of information you can find in these documents. The documents themselves are in the form of bundles or forms and correspondence, and they can include all the information you can see listed on the screen now. So you've got personal information, application forms, medical details for their period of service, articles of uniform received, and so on and so forth. And when we say correspondence, that's correspondence within the army. You can search these by name in Discovery, although it's often best to do this with just a name, a surname and a forename. They have been digitised and they're available to view online for a small fee. If you can't find a personnel record, and then unfortunately it doesn't survive, there are however quite a few places you can still look instead. The first stop would be campaign medal index cards. Most of these survive and they're in the series WO372. These are also name searchable via discovery and available to view online for a small fee. The cards don't contain as much information as a service record, but they will confirm name, rank, core and service number. I'll just highlight a few of those on screen now. So we have the core in this box, the rank in this box, the service number in this box, and obviously the woman's name in this box up here.
some cards also tell you the theatre of war the women served in, the date of entry into that theatre of war, and the medals they were entitled to. So theatre of war, if it was included on this card, would be down here, and the date of entry would be just below it. Any medals the woman received will be in the box I'm highlighting at the moment. And you can see that this particular woman, she received the Victory Medal and the British War Medal. The Remarks box just next to it includes some military coding for some correspondence, but it can also include other bits and pieces of information and recommendations for gallantry awards. You could follow up any recommendations for gallantry awards, um, military medals, CBEs, OBEs and MBEs. They're held in the record series W0162 forward slash 65. This contains the award documents for the women from the WAX and the QMAX who are recommended for these awards. They aren't name searchable in discovery and they are, in an original, they are an original record. So in this instance, you would either have to come to Q and view the records yourself or pay for a copy of them to be made for you. To find this record, all you need to do is type WO162 forward slash 65 into discovery. The document you need is the entire file. You'll have to go through it to find the name of the woman that you're looking for, as the file covers all of the WAX and the QMAX recommended for gallantry awards. If you do find the right documents, though, they can provide a good source of information. That can include when the recommendation was given, the date the recommendation was cited in the London Gazette, the role of the woman in the WAC or the QMAX. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you also get a reason for their award. And sometimes you also get an address where they live or their next of kin. So I've just put an example on screen here. We've pulled out and magnified a section of the document that we had on underneath it. And you can see the particular woman in question here. She received an MBE. And you can see that she was a controller in the QMAX. It's quite faint, but it does say that there. The next records we're looking at here are war diaries, and they're in the series WO95-84 and WO95-85. These cover the WAX and the QMAX who served abroad in France, close to the front line. They tend to mention individuals more than the standard army war diaries, and in particular the names of those who are admitted and discharged from hospitals and arrivals from other units. They can also give some really great insights to the day-to-day -day activities of the WAX and the QMAX. We've just pulled out a particular detail of this document to show you. Um, you can see here that um, some soldiers have proposed marriage to some of the workers. And I'm also highlighting where they're noting that there's going to be a dance held at the Crystal Palace YMCA. These war diaries will be available to view online very soon. They're currently being digitised. To search for them when they're available, all you need to do is search for WO95 forward slash 84 and WO95 forward slash 85 in the discovery search bar. They're the only two diaries for the WAX and the QMAX. So the next service we're going to look at is Women's Royal Naval Service, or also known as the RENS. They were formed in 1917 and very quickly received thousands of applications from female recruits. By the end of the war, there were approximately 5,500 members, 500 of whom were officers. All positions below an officer are known as ratings, and they equate to other ranks in the army. Some women had the opportunity to serve in theatres of the war, as well as shore bases on the home front. There were positions for ranks and other ratings. The ratings roles included jobs such as typists, cleaners, machinists, riggers, and messengers. Uh, there were even some aircraft women, although these were often transferred to the WAF when it was created in 1918. You will find service records for other ratings in the series ADM336. These are name searchable on Discovery, and they're available to view online for a small fee. Now, although this document here, which is an example of an ADM336 service record, it looks pretty sparse, 
but it actually contains all of the following information. They can tell you the date when someone enlisted. I'm highlighting that for you now. They can tell you discharge details, so the date they were discharged and the reason. I'm highlighting that for you now. So this is the date this particular woman, Josephine Carr, was discharged, and the reason up here, DD, means discharge dead. So she was actually the first and only casualty for the Wrens. Her ship, the Leinster, was torpedoed in 1918, and you can hear it says D, it says the ship, SS Leinster. The date of birth or the age of the woman is also shown on the card. Um, the next of kin, and in this case, an address. Um, the ship, again, or the establishment is listed, the establishment being the name of the shore base. It's listed whether the woman was mobile or immobile. Mobile means that she was able to leave um, British soil and go and travel on the ships. Immobile means she needed to stay and work on her shore base. If she was transferred to the WAFs, this will also be noted on her service record for the RENs. Sometimes there's also character references and if there's a gratuity paid when they're demobilised. Officer service records, on the other hand, can be found in the series ADM 318 and ADM 321. ADM 321 is a register of REN officers and they're very brief lists. However, personnel files are in ADM 318. These are names searchable on Discovery and available to view online for a small fee. The records will tell you more about officers' roles, which are more senior than ratings, but they still didn't equate to male responsibility in the same position in the Navy. REN officers' responsibilities included roles such as overseeing other women and senior positions. Here you can see just one page of a REN service record. A report on her character and suitability is what it's referring to. You can also find information that includes present occupation, previous experience. Sometimes they included references from other jobs. It includes their rate, can include their rate of pay, wages, grants, uniforms, um, any correspondence inside the Navy. Uh, some telephone memoranda, memorandums, the list of their duties, leave requests, um, rank, and any transfers. The next service we're going to examine is the Women's Royal Air Force, or the WAFs. The Royal Air Force was the last service to establish a women's corps. They founded the Women's Royal Air Force in 1918, and it's commonly known under the acronym WRAF with a silent, a silent R when you pronounce it WAF. In order to free men up for the front, uh, the WAF women took over roles such as drivers, clerks, mess orderlies, cooks and telephonists. Women were not allowed to fly, but they still had the opportunity to serve abroad in places such as France, France and Belgium. You can find service records for these women in the series Air 80. Again, these are name searchable and available to view online for a small fee. These records can vary in the amount of information that's given, and like other personnel records, were in the form of bundles of forms and correspondence before they were all digitised. On screen now, you can see a list of all the information that can possibly be included in a, a WAF service record. So you have age and physical description, address, things like next of kin, conduct at work, you even have their religion and any transfers in and out, possibly some casualty and medical information as well. Now we come to the Merchant Navy and the home services. First of all, we'll look at the Merchant Navy. Women are present in the Merchant Navy both prior to and during the First World War, but this is in a very diminished capacity compared to other services. There are no service records for men or women during the First World War. The tiny portion of records we do hold for this period are extremely difficult to find, and a lot of them were destroyed by the government after the war. Because of this, if you do want to know more, then please do ask us at the end of this presentation, and we'll be happy to go through it with you. But because the chance of actually finding anything is so slim, we don't want to run out of time, so we're going to continue straight on to the home services. So we have the Women's Land Army. 
Although normally associated with the Second World War, the Women's Land Army, or the WLA, was actually first created in January 1917, and it had three sections, agricultural, timber cutting, and foraging. It was set up to help increase the amount of food grown in Britain whilst the men were away fighting. Unfortunately, there are no personnel records for the Women's Land Army in the First World War that survive at all. You can find very few examples of campaign medal index cards in the series WO372. I'm highlighting the example that we have for you on screen now. There should be a blue box surrounding it. As you can see, it's empty of any medals. This is because people are only entitled to campaign medals if they've served abroad in a theatre of war. The WLA only served on the home front and never left English soil. So the ones we have for the WLA are for those who mistakenly applied to campaign medals. And the cards themselves will be unable to do anything other than confirm their name and the fact that they served in the Women's Land Army. We do hold some really interesting records relating to policy and, and administration of the WLA in the First World War. These were for government use only and contain some example documents like the certificate and the armband you can see on screen here. They can be really useful for general context, but they won't provide any personal details for particular women. Now we come to volunteer services. There were two main volunteer services, the voluntary aid detachments, who were trained by the British Red Cross Society and St John's Ambulance. And we also have the first aid nurse in Yeomanry. Because these services are voluntary, the majority of these women were upper, of upper and middle class backgrounds. This was due to their ability to pay for their own training and equipment, and the fact that as it's a voluntary service, they received no pay for their, for their work. The first one we're going to look at are the VADs, or the voluntary aid detachments. These are probably the most well-known voluntary service, and their roles included things like canteen workers, as you can see in the picture here, cooks, and perhaps most popularly, the image of the VAD nurse. VADs were not actually allowed to become nurses until October 1914, but from this point onwards, nursing numbers expanded rapidly. They went from over 9,000 to 23,000 by the end of 1918. Unfortunately, TN, uh, the National Archives holds little personal information, but as with other services, we do hold some policy and administration information for the VADs. And again, this is really good and interesting contextual information. In addition, we also hold campaign mail index cards. Again, these are name searchable in discovery and available to view online for a small fee. The one we have on screen for you just here is the medal card for Vera Britton. Now, this is the famous author who wrote Testament of Youth. She was also a VAD nurse, which inspired some of that book, and a very famous pacifist as well. So another voluntary service to look at is the First Aid Nursing Yeomanry. Now, these ladies have the fabulous acronym FANY and are wonder wonderfully referred to as the Fannies. The Fannies were founded in 1909 and they're called Yeomanry um, as most original pre-First World War volunteers in this corps were mounted and they were required to provide their own horse. And rather than simply nurses, Fannies saw themselves as combat medics. Their roles included ambulance drivers, canteen workers, frontline nursing and first aid. And the Fanny's desire to be in the thick of it meant that they were not fully supported by the British Army. This meant that they mainly worked with foreign and allied forces, such as the Belgian and French armies. The Fanny's are the world's longest established uniformed voluntary military organisation for women, and today the only all-woman military unit left in the UK. And you can see from the insignias on screen here that they are still running indeed. So as with the VADs, unfortunately, the National Archives does not hold any personnel information other than a few campaign medal index cards. You may find if you're elsewhere, searching elsewhere for someone specific, they have foreign awards and honours from allied armies they worked with. There are a number of fannies who received uh, the Croix de Guerre, for example. Those records are not kept with the National Archives, though. So we're going to go over a few other record series that you can check out. Um, they can cover the range of services that we've discussed today. They aren't all encompassing and they are mainly useful as contextual resources. You're unlikely to be able to trace a specific person, but they're always worth looking in while you're conducting your research. The first one we're going to look at is the record series MH106. These are a small selection of sample medical records and a fabulous source of general information. 
you have a slim chance of finding someone specific because they are so few and they are just samples but they're still worth checking as they cover female nurses and women in the military services. There are original documents and we have an example on screen with a drawing that a doctor very kindly made um, and you can, they can be seen on site at queue or you can pay for a copy to be made for you. To find them all you need to do is type women and refine your search series to MH106 in an advanced discovery search. Again, the document that we've provided for you will tell you exactly how to do this or post any questions you might have to Lauren. These documents list names when they entered and discharged from hospital, how long their treatment was. It includes information like their religion and how long the women served for. They're really useful and show, showcase what kind of illnesses and diseases that were affecting the women of the army. Quite often you can see things like measles and gastritis, um, varicose veins, um, even some STDs and in some cases shell shock, although I don't think it was referred to that um, during this period. Now we're going to look at Red Cross registers. The Royal Red Cross is a military decoration and was introduced to military nursing by Royal Warrant by Queen Victoria on St George's Day in 1883. It's awarded to military nurses for exceptional services, devotion to duty and professional competence and it's still being awarded today. The records that we have here contain information about nurses across the different services, sometimes including notes as to the reason for the award. You can often find Queen Alexandra nurses receiving this decoration and these, these documents can be a useful extra resource to check for information if you have a specific woman that you're looking for. To find an entry, you must consult the registers of the recipients of the Royal Red Cross. These are found in the record series WO145. They're arranged into sub-pieces by year range. So we have 1883 to 1918, 1918 to 1943, and 1943 to 1994. Now, if the First World War nurse in question received one, uh, a Royal Red Cross in 1918, you may need to consult both registers to rule out which one she was placed in. So the record is organised by an index at the front. I'm just going to highlight what that page looks for you now. The recipients of the award are broadly alphabetically listed by surname. To find a registration, first find the name in this index. Next to it will be an entry page number and an entry number. You have to follow this to the entry page in the register and I'll just highlight what an entry page actually looks like. So this one here you can see I think is page 206. When you get to your entry page you'll be able to see some more details. We can see from this entry we have Miss Ethel Smithies. She was found on page 208 and her number as you can see is 11912. This is the entry award number, not her service number. You can see that she served with the Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service, so she was a queen. Recipients would either be awarded a first or second class Royal Red Cross. This will be noted on the record, and you can see here that Ethel was awarded the first class. Some of these entries are teamed with notations on particular deeds or cutouts of citations from the London Gazette. So this source can be a really interesting and revealing one. So we're just going to briefly go through some sources and records from elsewhere that might be of use to you. British Red Cross Museum and Archive um, is a fantastic place to go for more information on VADs and VAD records. You have the London Gazette, this is online, and you can look medal citations up uh, mentioned in dispatches as well. The Ministry of Defence has RAF nursing service records. And we have the Imperial War Museum. Now, the Imperial War Museums were set up in 1917, this was specifically to collect and record the efforts and sacrifice of Britain and its allies during the First World War. Its remit was expanded to cover all conflict involving British or Commonwealth forces since 1914 and they do have a, a very interesting section on women's services in the First World War. So that's another fantastic place to look. So this brings us to the end of the presentation. I'd like to thank you all very much for listening today. Um, I'm going to pass you back to Lauren um, just a moment for any questions that you have.
On a final note, um, as she's already said, this is the first time we've used this particular software and webinars are a quite a new format for the National Archives in general. So we'd really appreciate any feedback you have at all. And also we'll be sending you by email um, a survey. If you would, wouldn't mind send, uh, filling that out and returning it, that would be absolutely fantastic so we can review how this has gone today. This podcast is copyright to the National Archives, rights reserved. It is available for reuse under the terms of the Open Government Licence.